Hello, everybody, and welcome to Conscious Conversion. Today, I have a beautiful, witchy woman that I am so excited to introduce you to. Um, her name is Phyllis Curret. Is it Curret? Curret. We say Curat. Yeah. Yeah. Curat. Yeah. Phyllis Curat. Um, she is a pioneering spiritual teacher and one of America's first public Wiccan priestesses. She lectures and teaches internationally on the divine feminine, the spiritual wisdom of the earth and the rapidly emerging indigenous spiritual traditions of ancient Europe and the Middle East, as well as her unique tradition of shamanic Wicca. Phyllis is an attorney and an outspoken advocate in the courts and media on behalf of pagans, Wiccans and other religious minorities. And is also the internationally best-selling author of Book of Shadows, a modern woman's journey into the wisdom of witchcraft and the magic of the goddess witchcrafting, a spiritual guide to making magic and the love spell. This year, she is releasing a new and spiritually revolutionary witches tarot deck for Hay House. I am so excited to see that deck. And Phyllis offers workshops, classes, readings, and consults, um, which we'll, we'll talk about all of these things, I'm sure. Um, but welcome to the show, Phyllis. I'm so excited to have you here. There's so much that I just spewed out of my mouth that I'm so interested in learning more about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. I've been looking forward to it. Ah, yay. So tell me first, what is the impact that you would want to make in the world in the next several years? <laughs> um, well, this is a lifelong project, actually, right? Uh, so unexpected path, but exactly where I was supposed to be. And, um, and it, it feels as if the world is ready for and certainly in need of witch's wisdom, uh, which is a 5,500-year-old word, word. It goes back to the Proto-Indo-European. It meant a wise one, a seer of the sacred, a shaman. And, mm. um, and th that ability to see the sacred, not just in realms of spirit, which of course is, is a, a cultivated skill and capacity, something that we can all experience, contrary to what our Western cultures told us, the most important gift. And, and it was, it's been used, right, for millennia, for practical purposes, especially for healing and uh, for guidance and for communion with the sacred. But I think um, about midway through my personal journey, I came to realize that the greatest gift was the ability to see the sacred in the world in which we live. And it is the thing that is most paramount. It's, it's, the, it's the missing moral compass, right? Mm -hmm. It is the source of balm and healing and sustenance and nourishment in a time of incredible growing crises and stresses, political, environmental, social, um, economic, it's the source of wisdom and healing and all the things that we have forgotten for the last millennia and that are essential to not just our survival, but our ability to thrive, to come back into a right relationship with the planet. We are facing a cataclysm. You know, we've created it out of our separation from the sacred and uh, a blindness you know, that, that is the result of history and habit and enculturation. And the thing that we need most is actually within us and all around us. We just have to learn to take the blindfold off. And that's my work. My work is about teaching people simple, basic, ancient, very, and also modern techniques for taking that blindfold off and seeing the sacred in the world around them and then discovering it in themselves kind of the reverse of the new age movement, which has always said, look within, look within, look within. Um, but when what is within is not whole, right? There's only so much you're gonna find. Oddly enough, if we look to the world around us, to the natural world around us, we find what we need. And so that's my work. My work is to help people take the blindfold off and see the sacred in the world around them to learn from it uh, because it's it, everything we need to live in ways that are healthy and abundant and fulfilled and creative and peaceful and balanced and harmonious, all of which sounds impossible, right, in the current reality, in fact, is the way in which the natural world is ordered. I love it so much. I mean, it just, it, 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 
it gives me shivers, like uh, uh, goosebumps to even to, to hear you speak about, about that. And I'm curious, just for, for those of us that really want it to be explicit, how would you define sacred? So that when I'm looking out outside of myself and I'm looking at, say, you know, a street with people walking on it and cars, how do I find the sacred in the everyday mundane? The fastest, the easiest way to do it uh, is to connect with the natural world. And uh, while uh, that's sort of increasingly under stress and unavailable to us, in fact, it's available in a city, in your apartment, uh, where you would least expect it. I've always said the divine is, um, uh, it's a breath away. And it's interesting because most spiritual traditions have practices that involve breathing. Um, including traditions that don't generally think about it, like Christianity, where you're actually, in fact, breathing with prayer and chanting and things of that sort. Um, but there's more to most uh, spiritual practices and religious traditions with breath than I think they've realized. And it's one of the gifts of which is wisdom, you know, of a shamanic perspective, that when you're breathing in, I was first taught years ago, I practiced yoga and then uh Early in my mid twenties, uh, I found my way into um, a hidden circle of women who were practicing this rebirth of the old religion, of the religion of the goddess, of this ancient shamanic tradition of our ancestors, and uh, and we would always begin with breathing. Right? And so you would inhale, and the mind would grow quiet and still, and you would exhale, and the body would relax and grow still, and you would inhale, bring the energy of prana or chi or you know, of creation into you, feel yourself, you know, becoming energized and exhale the garbage and the toxins and the waste and the carbon dioxide. And it works, you know, and that's the heart yeah. of most meditation traditions. It works, but the fact is there's something else going on. And I didn't realize this until about 10 years ago when I was sitting in the midst of a real stinky depression that had gone on for a very long time because I had really sort of woken up to how dire the 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 environmental crisis was and the cultural crisis that we'd created. And I felt overwhelmed and, and not up to the task of contributing anything to making the world a better place. I'm a one little tiny person in a population of what is it? Seven, 8 billion people. I'm a, you know, I, I, I couldn't be, you know, a stranger advocate, uh, you know, to somebody who actually goes into the public arena and calls herself a witch. You know, with all of the negative stereotypes that that conjures, none of which are real, but, you know, which are attached to the word. And here I am, you know, and I, who am I to think I can do anything to save it? Yeah, but the fact is we can all do something. And I was sitting in my backyard bereft and not feeling up to the task. And I heard, literally heard Mother speak to me, Mother Earth speak to me. And she said, listen, you know, you're, you're, you're no use to me like this. You're just no use to me. You're drowning in despair and it's not helpful. And if you, if you are not able to pull yourself out of this, I'll, I'll go find someone else. <laughs> and I had enough ego left to sort of like, no, no, no. I, I, I want to share what you've shown me because she had sort of started to show me the, the great wisdom of creation and how life is organized to sustain and create life and the beauty and the harmony and the balance and the magic of it. And, and yet, you know, my despair was coming from the mess that we'd made of all of that. Um, and she said, breathe. And I was like, uh. <laughs> she said, no, 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 just breathe. So I was like, oh yes, I remember. Inhale the energy of, uh, and exhale yeah. the toxins. And within a few minutes, I was breathing in the old way and I was calm and my mind opened and my body relaxed. And, and I inhaled and I inhaled this sort of humor and this sort of tickly, giggly hmm. energy. And I heard these voices laughing and I was like, oh, yeah, what's that? And I, and I noticed that the leaves around me were trembling in the trees above my head and the grass was moving and there was like hardly any breeze. And the, I could feel the vitality and the aliveness of the plants. And I felt their breath of life entering me. And I realized that what I was inhaling was the breath of life that all the green plants were offering me in their generosity and their balance and their essential harmony and, and just the generosity of of their being because everything depends on them. 
right? Yeah. They're, the, they're the foundation. I, of all of them. Yeah. And I exhaled and I realized I wasn't exhaling waste. I was exhaling the breath of life. In a certain sense, I existed to offer that to them. There is no waste in nature. One thing becomes another in the mother. I was just having this thought this morning as I was dumping out my compost. <laughs> you know, there's nothing. I remember talking to my kid and saying, um, you know, I don't, that doesn't, I don't want that to go to waste. So eat your oatmeal. I don't want it to go to waste or whatever. And it's like, there is nothing that goes to waste. That's Anything right. that I put out here, some beautiful animal is going to come eat, or it's going to go into the into the dirt and enrich the enrich the soil. There's so much that that happens with things, and I have a very similar sort of experience to you, where I was depressed. I started to tell you about this before I, we hit record, where I was depressed and stressed the fuck out in 2017, mm-hmm. and I had this moment here in Costa Rica before I moved here, um, where I was at a waterfall that's now tattooed on my arm. And I just looked up at her and I was like, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. What can I do? Uh, Like I have made a fucking mess of it as humanity and as an individual, like Gaia, take the wheel. (laughs) I'll just take over. I, I fucked it up. And ever since then, I tell you what, like it has been magical. Any agnostic or atheist bone in my body is gone. Like she was just like, oh, honey, okay, now you're ready. <laughs> That's right. That um, moment, that epiphany and that moment yeah. of humility and yeah. of surrender of saying, I don't know how to do this, but I know that you do. Show me. <laughs> right. And one of, the, one of the great lessons that I had about 10 years ago, a little more actually, God, in Italy, um, working with a, a group of, of students over there. And the spirits of place spoke. I mean, the great spirit of place, of course, is Mother Earth. But the local spirit, of place, and, and they said, just ask us what we need. And we mm-hmm. will help. Just ask us what we need. We will tell you. We will show you how to live. Just ask. And from there on, it was, it, that's what it's been. It's been a journey of, of recognizing how utterly ignorant we all are. And how available the wisdom all is. And how powerful we are if we open ourselves up to it. Yes. I mean, this is the great journey now of what is our place? Everything has a place in creation. Everything has a purpose. Everything fits into this sustaining, life-generating web of creation. So what's our place? It certainly can't be what it's been, right, to, to... think that we're in control when we don't even begin to understand what's actually going on and to consume and to destroy. No, that's not, that can't possibly be our purpose, right? But we have about five minutes to figure it out. So you're asking me what my purpose is. That's my purpose. My purpose is to help us um, become humble, uh, open, uh, connected, attentive, uh, inspired, nourished, uh, to learn how to do this properly, to give back, To accept ourselves in the completely flawed way that we are. You know, I'm still living up here in New York, you know, and even if I bought a a hybrid car or an electric car, that charge would be coming from, you know, a plant. We have a lot of work to do that's burning fossil fuels. There's a huge amount of contribution, but the point is directed in the right direction and to be paying attention and to learning. And the intention matters. And I, um, I, I wanted that kind of brings me to sort of an, another, another perspective that I want to bring in, which is about sort of, you know, this podcast is about marketing and spirituality and how to reconcile business, entrepreneurship, marketing, getting our word out there, being online, um, which I very much am and my clients very much are, and this deep wisdom of Mother Earth and being in nature and and spirituality and things that really have n- seemingly have nothing to do with each other. So I'm curious, you as a Wiccan priestess, I freaking love that. Um, as as a, a, a shamanic priestess, how do you reconcile? You've got an online presence. You've got a website. How do you reconcile your online presence and your your power as as a being of of nature? Um, so let me try to be concise. <laughs> In five uh, words or less. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, 20 years ago when I wrote my first book, Book of Shadows, um, I, it was published with a major publisher and I had the opportunity 
to be public. I already was. I was public in 1981. I went like the minute I was initiated, I, I was I went public. And then, you know, how public became bigger and bigger. And part of it was through the cases that I took and part of it was through the work I was doing and et cetera. When I had the opportunity to write this first book, that that magnified my my visibility. And I prepared for it. I was like, I have a responsibility. I have an opportunity. Um, and which most people practicing this particular faith didn't have because I was self-employed. I was a lawyer, you know, I could, I could do it. And it was in my nature to, to slap on the breastplates and pick up the spear and go out there and open the way. Um, but I was so clear about the beauty and the wisdom and the necessity for that beauty and wisdom in the spiritual path um, that it made me, it, I found my strength and my purpose and my purpose was to clear up the negative stereotypes to open the way um, so that people could find this ancient wisdom and um, to find the sacred, as you asked, where is it a breath away to find it in the world around them and in themselves. And so I, you know, I was ready to go, but I didn't have the skills. So I actually went out and I, and I took some classes, whatever, you know, tutoring, mentoring from a media person who told me to, you know, to how to tighten up my cheeks so I looked like I was smiling and keep my shoulders back and sit on my jacket and, you know, all this stuff, which was enormously helpful. Uh, and how to boil my message into short sound bites, which I, a skill I've completely lost. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I went out there and I went out there prepared, right? And I knew what my purpose was, right? To, to bring the world uh, the good news of witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> but right. And, and I, boy, was I out there, you know, I was on rap radio shows. Those guys are super professional. I walked in and I thought, Oh, I'm a dead white girl. No, I'm the dead white woman. I'm really in trouble. I'm not even general <laughs> generationally like hip, you know? Uh, and they could not have been more marvelous or open or professional about it. And I took on Bill O'Reilly, you know, and at the end of it, he was like my, my wicked friend, Phyllis. And I, you know, I went into places that no witch would dare to go and spoke my piece and did it in a way that people could hear me. I articulated what I needed to say in a way that resonated. I corrected for the distortion in the lens and I spoke the truth as I had discovered it. And people responded. They were amazed and they were fascinated. Well, I took off for a long time. I went into apprenticeship with Mother Earth and I came back and there was a social media revolution. And certainly, you know, I'm not of that generation. And initially I, I didn't like it. I found it, uh, as we were talking about earlier, I found it uh, exhibitionistic and hollow. You know, I wasn't interested in looking at what people had eaten for dinner. And I wasn't interested in looking at the Kardashians, you know, posing from the right angle with the latest fashion, it just seemed empty. And I didn't like the voyeurism either. So I was resistant. I had a website, but I was resistant to social media. And then gradually I was asked to do uh, a series on YouTube about Wicca. And they were these little short videos and short's not my nature, but I had learned to do it. So I did them and suddenly, not suddenly, I mean, it took five years, but there were 2 million cumulative views. And I realized, ah, uh, just like going on, you know, the Bill O'Reilly show or doing radio or talking to the Sun Sentinel or the New York Times or the stuff that I had done 20 years ago, this is the new medium. And I don't have to go through mainstream media to reach people. I can do it here. I don't understand it. I haven't mastered it. I'm only just beginning, but I understand that it's a microphone. It's a way of reaching people. Certainly, you know, our, our, terrifying so-called president has mastered it. He uses it to speak directly to uh, an audience that responds to him. So if there's, if there's truth in what one has to say, if there's value in the message that you've been asked to bring, you know, and I was asked, I was shown certain things by mother and asked to carry them. And I accepted the responsibility that I would carry them. And what's the point of being shown something beautiful, wise, and true, if, if you can't share it with other people. Um, so the, the task is to, like I learned to sit on my jacket and, and 
puff my cheeks like a chipmunk, you know, look cheerful 20 years ago. So you learn how to create a meme. Um, it, it does seem a little bit um, time consuming in a way that, uh, that many years ago, you know, when I was a student of photography at RISD, I would have enjoyed it more. Right now I'm sort of, you know, I would like to put my time into the things that I do best, which is writing and teaching and lecturing and sharing practices with people rather than reducing things to sound bites. And putting well, them I mean, have you, have you mastered the art of, of delegating your, your social media yet? <laughs> and if so, if so, how have you managed to stay authentic to your own voice in doing that? Great question. So, um, no, I'm just learning. I have um, an assistant. I have some wonderful folks that have been ha that have because when people hear uh, the the message from mother, which is um, for yeah, it, it, they respond right. There's something it resonates with them, and they recognize. I've always said this about witchcraft that people, when they discover what it's really all about, they always say it feels like they're coming home, mm. and so this is. This is like what you, once you're home, this is what it feels like. This is what's cooking on the stove. You know, this is what the, the blanket that's put over you when you go to sleep to have sweet dreams feels like. It's like, this is why you've come home, right? This is the beauty and the wonder and the magic of it. And people respond and then they offer to help. But there are times when you need professional assistance. And I think that by being true to your, to your truth, by being true to your message, by being true to the gift that you've been given to share, um, that is what steers the ship, right? So it doesn't have to be inconsistent. It certainly doesn't have to be voyeuristic. Um, it is simply a way of, of mastering the medium as a creative outlet. And professional help uh, is wonderful because you're the one who's determining what the ship looks like, what energy it's running on, and where it's going. The professionals help you, you know, to to fashion the boat and run the boat and steer the boat. And they can also give you lots of information about where to find the people uh, with whom your message is going to resonate. That, that is certainly one of the great gifts of uh, professional social media folks that they understand mm -hmm. where the audience is and how to reach them. Um, I, you know, I watched that dreadful guy that worked for Trump, and who's now left, who threatened to kill himself when they put him outside the tent, right? He couldn't take it. I can't remember his name, Brad Pars Parscal. Say what you will, but you know, he was a master of the medium. The message was poisonous, but the medium does not have to, I, I, I remember, you know, the old days, really old, right? With uh, what's his name, who said the, the medium is the message. And initially I felt that was so, but I think that the message can transform the medium. Um, Absolutely, thank you, yeah. Yeah, so I agree. I, if you're true to your message and you know what it is and it's, and it's, um, and it's got value, um, it will resonate with people. And professionals who, who can help you find those people are, are a gift. I love that though. The message can transform the medium is, I mean, obviously I'm all about that because we all know that we're not trying to throw more money into corporate, you know, hands that are, you know, I don't know if anybody's watched the, the documentary, what is it called? It just came out. I haven't even seen it yet, but a lot of my, a lot of my colleagues and friends have seen it. Um, oh gosh, what is it called? Social something. It's on Netflix. Um, but it's talking about sort of the, these sort of the, the darkness of social media. And so to me, um, rather than everybody getting off and then not knowing how to find each other again, because we've gotten so dependent on this, how can we transform it, transform it with the intent that we use when we're, that we have, when we're using it, transform it with the message that we have and, um, and then create something new in the process. Right. I, I think, you know, it is. You know, it's look. It's like I was. We were also talking before that. You know, the fact is that I live in New York, and um, although I will use my bicycle as much as I can, you know, there are times I did. Yeah, I don't have a choice. I have to get in my car and I have to drive. Um, so there are contradictions all the time. I would rather not drive on Facebook, right? I would rather not be there. I would rather not use it. Um, but this is what you have when you have a monopoly, right? So then. But, and it was like, did I want to go on Bill O'Reilly, right? Did I want to go on Fox? 
No, but I made that decision years ago that I was going to use, as you said, you know, I'm going to use the, the patriarchal structures to help dismantle the, the patriarchy. Um, I, you, you, will, you know, I, you think having a witch on your show is good for you? Good. It's going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be good for my message. I'm happy to be there. But no, I will not wear a pointy hat. You know. Oh, my God. So yeah. you, set, you set the parameters of your participation. Yeah. So I think it's, a, you know, it, it's, it's darker and more nefarious, but it's, it's, it's just the new version of the old contradiction. And I think you have to be mindful. And I think you can do it without feeling corrupted. You take advantage of the platform uh, to transform the greater context and then the platform will, will be forced to transform as well. So, yeah. What, yeah. what would you say is your sort of next level? You've got, you've got a Hay House tarot deck um, in the works coming out um, and, and you've got these beautiful intentions of helping people see the sacred um, and be the sacred. What's the next level of you, of you reaching um, more people with your, with your message? Well said. Uh, some of it you can control and some of it you can't, right? So, uh, so you do as much as you can. And I uh, personally, I feel like I'm like juggling 40 ping pong balls and I really <laughs> rather just have three basketballs, you know, <laughs> so that's sort of where I, and I look at, I, from, I mean, I want to reach the largest audience I can as quickly as I can. And, and speed is extremely important because, um, we're looking at environmental crises that are related to time. You know, we don't have 50 years. 30 years ago, um, at, was it 30? My gosh, it was 30 years ago. I attended the first parliament of the world's religions. Uh, one of my tip of the spear efforts. I was the chair of a, a, a big international pagan organization. And it was a struggle to get in and to participate, but you know, it happened. And the, the opening of the parliament was um, uh, a scientist who uh, had just done a study for the, called the Millennium 2000 report. And he'd done it for President Jimmy Carter a number of years back. And he basically laid out what, where we were headed environmentally. And I was sitting in this huge room with all these religious uh, officiants and practitioners from all over the globe. And everybody was crying. You know, because we're all children of Mother Earth and we're all living on the same planet and the crises that we were facing were uh, terrifying. And everything that he had predicted in terms of global warming and, and the increased violence and uh, long list, and I don't want to go into it now because we're, you know, we're living with it. We know what it is. Uh, he was laying out and it was terrifying. And he said, you know, we have 20 to 30 years. Well, that was 30 years ago. And the science is very clear. We have a very short window to reverse the damage that we're doing. We have, we have 50% of the plants and animals on this planet are uh, going extinct. And if you, if you tear the web of life, um, it cannot sustain life. So we are the source of that tearing. And um, you know, we have to begin by healing ourselves and by healing our relationship with the planet. So I want my message out. Um, and it, it's a simple message. You know, you're living in a sacred world. You have to learn to live in a sacred way. And to do that, you have everything you need already in you because you are, in fact, a part of it. And it's all around you. You simply have to pay attention. You have to take off the blindfold. And these simple practices help you to do it. So it's not an idea. It's a lived experience. I want yeah. that out as far as I can get it, as wide as I can get it, as, as powerfully and as simply and as inspiring as possible because we don't have a lot of time. So, you know, mastering the medium and harnessing it and putting it to work uh, as quickly as possible uh, is, is, you know, it's essential to what we have to do. And one of the marvelous things about the internet is how quickly, how quickly, if you capture the imagination of people, uh, and you offer something that's true and valuable, how quickly people will respond, like Greta Thunberg. Mm. You know, this young girl who simply chose to sit in front of her school. Well, it would have had no impact if it had not reached the awareness of a global community and then look what happened. So toxic though the, the, the you know, those in charge of the medium may be, you know, and nefarious and foul as many of the 
people who use it may be, um, it's a gift. And it's an astonishing thing to be able to communicate with um, millions and more. Billions. And, yeah. and that is the thing that can tip. Can exactly. Change. Exactly. You know? <laughs> I mean, personally, I feel like it's, you know, that a lot of us, it's not just me, but a lot of us are working in this numinous realm, which is embodied, which is the missing piece of the puzzle, you know, because you can only go so far in changing things if people are motivated by fear. I'm terrified that, you know, that the globe, that I'm, there's going to be a flood. I'm terrified that my children, you know, we're going to be living in a world that, doesn't sustain them. Fear only takes you so far. You get burnt out by it. You get exhausted by it. You withdraw from it. You go into denial because it can't sustain you. It doesn't nourish you. It doesn't make you feel good. It makes you feel bad. And so people withdraw. But we don't need to do it that way. We can do it from a position of inspiration and true nourishment of body and soul because it's there. You know, it's just ask. It's right there. And that message, I think that message can carry but we need help. I need help. We all need help in learning how to master the medium. So I had, you know, I worked with some professionals um, when we did the Awaken the Witch Within course for Hay House. Um, and I'm very glad that I, that I brought them in because they helped magnify the message and, and reach people through Facebook ads. But they made some really bad mistakes of like failing to, to go to my Facebook <laughs> family you know they they advertised to everyone but my folks um so i learned you know you got to have good help you have to really have people who aren't just well-intentioned or who have their own reasons to build their own business but who know what they're doing um and yeah. I, with that assistance the world needs to hear things that inspire and that sustain and that nourish yeah if you can find professionals that know how to do it I'm, you know, I'm there. I, I, I certainly know that I need to do that. I need that help. But there's only so much. Know, I would do. be super honored to have that conversation with you at some point. And yeah. I also would love to, to tell our listeners what it is that you're currently offering. I know you've got your tarot deck coming out that I'm really excited about because I, I love tarot. Um, and then um, you have a, do you have a course currently being offered or any, or consulting? Yeah, I do. I mean, so this is one of the wonderful things about working. We're, first of all, we're all online right now because of the pandemic, right? Um, so, you know, I've, I've gotten more skillful and I've been doing a lot of lecturing about uh, all sorts of things, you know, this teaching. But it turns out that I was given the opportunity to do this tarot deck. And I was thrilled because, you know, if you're a witch, you read tarot. You use divination. If you're doing yeah. any kind of shamanic practice, and my mind has always been a shamanic uh, approach to it, because um, I was, was doing core shamanism at the very beginning of my training as a as a young Wiccan priestess, so I meshed the two of them, and I had the opportunity. So I know, you know, the value of divination. Um, it's a way of speaking to the divine and of getting mm. an answer and of getting an answer that's always in your best interest. Maybe cryptic, but it's always in your best interest. So I learned how to read. I mean, a tarot reading was a tarot reading was how I became a witch. I got an mm. invitation from the person who read my tarot to come join this group. So I've always valued it and learned how to read tarot. But I always was a little uncomfortable with the images of the devil and the tower and the the hierophant with the pope and judgment with people coming out of their graves and angels and crucifixes. And I'm like, ah, it's great. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom here you know I you know, I'm and there was a lot of innovation there because zillions of decks but there was still this sort of you know that that enlightenment comes by leaving the earth behind it just wasn't and even I'm it, so with you on that right and a lot of witches I love it here <laughs> hello right I mean this really, once you start to get it it's mind-blowing <laughs> best oh, place in the cosmos Right. It is, as a matter of fact. Um, there's a reason that we're here. So, <laughs> so I was asked by Hay House. I did this a course for them called Awaken the Witch Within, which is wonderful. I mean, you're talking about the medium. So it's always present. And I can, I'm teaching thousands of people, which I could previously, you know, if I had to be in a room with them, A, I wouldn't be able to do it now because of the pandemic. And B, what am I going to reach? Eight people or 
80 people, but online I can reach 8,000, I can reach 80,000 people. Um, and it's very interactive, it's very experiential, so it works. So Hay House came back to me after Awaken the Witch Within, which is now online and people can get it and, and take it at their leisure, you know, and go back and repeat practices and it has shamanic drumming, all the fundamental techniques um, that people can master to have these experiences themselves. So it's not ideas, it's experiences. And they asked me if I would do, I'm pointing to it behind me. They asked me if I wanted to do a Witch's Wisdom Tarot. And I was so excited and I journeyed and I said, what do I need to know to create a new witch's deck? And I was told, begin with the elements, not with the symbols. Uh, they're not metaphors. Begin with the elements themselves and they will show you what the world needs to know. And through a series of magic and synchronicities, um, uh, we were led to the artist that worked with me, Danielle Barlow, her work on my wall there. Uh, and interestingly enough, before we'd even talked, she also, this blew my mind, 40 years after I was practicing this, it was like the only person, she's in the countryside of Devon and what does she do before we'd even spoken? She journeyed and she asked the same question, what do we need to know to create a new witch's wisdom tarot, a witch's tarot? And, and she was told the same thing, begin with the elements. So we created this tarot deck and- Beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous and the text, is very different because I'm a writer. And so I wrote a very visionary and vision provoking text and there's magic with every card so people can experience the teaching. The major arcana are, re are revolutionary because they go in the opposite direction of all, virtually all the other decks which go from the magician controlling the elements, controlling the natural world to the world where you have this person who's floating out in space surrounded by symbols of the archangels. It's not the world, that's disembodied. But that's the journey that it offers is enlightenment by leaving the earth. Ours is the opposite. It starts in the world, which is was very shocking because um, part of the world is on fire, but there's a figure, the pilgrim, this young girl, and she's got a pack on her back like you, my dear, right? And she's leaving that world and she's going into the natural world. Mm, just mm -hmm. off screen, right? Yeah. It's pulling her and she's going. And then it proceeds in the opposite. So judgment is now initiation. Instead of souls leaving the earth, she's going into it. And, um, and she makes this journey, which proceeds into life, through life, into creation through mother earth where she's unmade, but then she's made again. And at the end, she comes out to the council of not the magician seeking to control everything, which is this patriarchal idea of magic, right? That you can supernaturally manipulate nature and get what you want out of it. I mean, it's totally patriarchal, but she comes finally to the council of all beings, which are all beings, the plants and the animals and indigenous peoples from all over the world. And she finds herself in their company and it is a company of kindness and humor and compassion and connection. And she sees the ultimate organizing. We all through the deck see this great profound embodiment of the divine and the way in which it works, which is that all things, the air and the water and the amoeba in your stomach and the squirrels running down the tree and the plants growing in your garden, Everything is interconnected and the ways in which they're interconnected is a kind of mutual interdependence and reciprocity. And when each thing takes care of itself, recreates, procreates, you know, defecates, so what, you know, is itself, is air properly, is amoeba in stomach, is squirrel. In fact, what's happening, biologists who do biomimicry, who study nature to learn from it, have discovered this and they call it nature's secret, nature's magic. So it's nature's secret magic. That in fact, what's happening is that when you're taking care of yourself properly, you're making the world in which you live better for all living things, for all of creation. That's the organizing principle of creation. That's really what my work's about is I love that whole thing. Thank you so much. That's and I want to tell people that they can find you um, at your website at phyllisCurat.com, which is P-H-Y-L-L-I-S. 
C-U-R-O-T-T dot com. That'll be in the show notes, as well as on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. Um, and you can find her tarot deck and all of her magnificent books on Amazon um, as well, unless you've got another, another alternative for folks to find it. And yeah, I'm, I would say, check it out, take that K house course buy the revolutionary tarot deck. Like I will. And um, thank you so much for being on the show. This was magical. Oh, it was really a joy. You I love those questions about reaching the world. You know, I've struggled with them for a long time and, and uh, there's a deep conversation to be had there. Um, but you know, we need, we need to, we need to speak truth to power now. And mm. so you, you use what's available to you. Um, the world needs witches wisdom. So thank you for giving me the chance to share some of it. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And um, stay tuned. We'll be talking more offline. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks for listening and have a beautiful day.